Quiet, please. 2450, take one. Oh, we have so much to be thankful for. You know, high fidelity can open up a whole new world of listening enjoyment. For example, suppose you're interested in some one particular instrument in the orchestra. By simply focusing and filtering our high fidelity microphones, we can bring up the volume of any instrument you like. I happen to like drums. So in this lovely arrangement of Ramona, we tuned our sound equipment so you'd be able to hear the subtle accents of the drums sneaking through. the old songs best, don't you? I don't like that beginning. I want it to just start out cold. I don't like that intro. It just occurred to me. The master of musical mayhem, Spike Jones, recording for Verve Records in 1957. The last voice belonged to the label's owner, Norman Grimes. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight it's Jazz of the Philharmonic Night in Los Angeles. Mr. Grimes on the concert stage introducing another aspect of his various endeavors. Norman Granz is a great catalyst. He's a man that has the ability to put together things that cause a fusion and cause sparks and they cause reaction. That was pianist Oscar Peterson. I'm Nat Hentoff and over the next six weeks, the career of a singular individual will be explored, an individual who did not play or sing a note, yet made an unparalleled impact on jazz and popular music. I knew Norman Granz for 50 years, and I once noted in an article that he was driven by a kind of Old Testament need to be just, but he was also capable of Old Testament-sized fury when crossed. Norman Granz, who was responsible for the groundbreaking Jazz of the Philharmonic Tours, five record companies, manager to both the First Lady of Song and one of the most acclaimed pianists in jazz. Norman Granz, who played tennis with Jimmy Connors, discussed art with Pablo Picasso, recorded Audrey Hepburn and Paul Robeson, presented Frank Zappa and the Osmonds in concert. Truly a man out of the norm. Morris Granzinski and Ida Clara Melnick both arrived in America during 1905, having fled from the anti-Semitism being unleashed in their native Russia. They married in 1910 settling in South Central Los Angeles, and on the 6th of August, 1918, a son, Norman, was born. A second son, Irving, completed the family unit in 1926. Norman enrolled at Roosevelt High School, and after graduating in 1936, became a student at UCLA's College of Arts and Sciences. Archie Green, the noted folklorist, went to school with Grands. They remained friends from that time on. In high school, I have no clear memory, and I think if anyone did, I would, of Norm being interested in music as a dominant force. It was background material. But as soon as we were at UCLA, I knew that Norman was interested in jazz and blues. This is Grand's biographer, Tad Hershon. He was about six foot one and lanky and, and good looking. And uh, once again, with just kind of a, a certain commanding personality, even going back to his high school days, I would say he uh, cut a striking figure. Again, Archie Green, along with another lifelong friend of Grand's, Gene Bach. He met Marie Bryant and he went out with her. 
Marie Bryant was one of his lady friends, early lady friends, and I knew her. She was divine, so attractive and so talented. She was a dancer and she sang. She uh, traveled with the Ellington Band. That was as, as near as I can tell his first girlfriend, which was admirable that he was mature enough to date a black gal, but also someone in show business. She had uh, two pictures on her dressing table. I think I was back in some dressing room when she was appearing somewhere, and they were her two beaus, Norman and John Garfield. I thought, boy, that's pretty good company. Leaving college in June of 1941, the 22-year-old Granz worked as an assistant film editor at MGM for a short period, then volunteered for the Army Air Corps. By June of the following year, his burgeoning interest in jazz had intensified. He met and became friendly with Nat King Cole, Billy Holiday, and the Young Brothers, tenorist Lester and drummer Lee. Soon, he was organizing jam sessions in clubs around South Central LA, one of them being the 331. Monday nights, I think, was when uh, Norman was presenting Nat King Cole Trio. So I would go out with a, a chum of mine who was a very hip jazz lady named Arlene Thompson, and we would go every Monday night to the 331. And um, I got to be friendly with Norman then. Gene Bach, in the summer of 1942, Granz was drafted back into the Army for another year. After his discharge, he continued to present his jam sessions at such clubs as the 331, the Trouville, and Billy Burgs. His end really was through Nat Cole and Lee Young, Lester's brother. Norman would not only uh, just go to where musicians hung, like in, in clubs, but also uh, house parties. Just made it his business to get to know the musicians, but also to begin to develop his own concept for how he was going to present the music, and that was everything from insisting that tables be put on the dance floors for these uh, bookings that he started doing in 1942, beginning at the Troville. He also uh, said that these jam sessions would be advertised so that musicians would be paid. And third and most importantly was the fact that from the day he began booking nightclubs in Los Angeles, he insisted on integrated audience, and in this case, he would tell the club owners if they liked the shows and wanted to retain them, that they would uh, integrate their clubs the uh, remaining six nights of the week. Grand's biographer Tad Hershaw 